I want to start this meeting by acknowledging that I'm holding this meeting on Indigenous lands, the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Tulalip tribes, successors in interest to the Snohomish, Snoqualmie, Skycomish people who since time immemorial have hunted, fished, gathered, and taken care of these lands. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and we honor their sacred spiritual connection with the land and the water. Um, I am broadcasting here from Mulcatillo, and um, so those are the, the land keepers here in my area, but I encourage you to just do a Google search um, and take a look at where you're at. Um, all right, so we're going to dive right into the big news for the Cannabis Alliance um, off the bat. So we have been planning and working hard to ensure that we have a safe, happy, comfortable in-person summit on September 23rd. <sighs> However, what is starting to feel like an inevitability anytime big hopeful plans are made. Um, we are uh, we made the decision as a board uh, yesterday to go ahead and move the summit back to an online format. Um, we are still we're sort of vetting for sure whether we want to continue with Remo again this year like we did last year. Um, however, we are going to move it all online. The um, variant. Uh, is just making it so we're not sure that we can do that safely and, and particularly out of respect for um, families who have unvaccinated folks in their household and mine, I've got two kids under 12. Um, we wanna make sure that, that we keep not only the people who are in attendance safe, but, but their households safe as well. Um, so we will be holding the summit over two days instead of the one Zoom fatigue is a real thing and it does not seem reasonable to expect all of us to sit online for uh, nine hours on one day, um, which is a fun thing in person because we get lunch involved and dinner and all of that good stuff. Um, but when we're left to our own devices in our um, homes and offices, uh, over two days, not quite so much packed in, uh, seems like also a better move. Um, we've already been in contact with speakers and panelists and so far so good on everybody that's going to be there. I wanna share with you um, some of the panels that we have planned. Um, we are going to be talking about sustainability. We have a guest speaker today, in fact, to talk a little bit about that. Um, we are. We also have an equity panel, um, a, a panel about innovate when innovation outpaces regulation, and you can assume that that a lot of that conversation is going to be about synthetically derived cannab cannabinoids. Um, we also have a panel on sports medicine and uh, cannabis, as well as employment and impairment, and then preparation for federalization. Um, so it'll be a lot of great conversation. Uh, we've got quite a few great speakers from now across the country I was able to reach out to a few folks who said can't make it in person, but um, would love to tune in and now I've been able to reach out and say so. <laughs> Um, now you can join us online, would you consider? So um, look forward to a more complete uh, speaker panel uh, sometime next week or a speaker list uh, so you can see who's going to be participating in those conversations. And Jill, I will turn it over to you if you'd like to talk about ticketing, please. Yeah, so we will have tickets out probably next week for everybody to purchase. And we know that it is going to be um, as, a, as a member, you're going to get some pretty steep discounts, so definitely keep your eyeballs out for that. Um, and I'll be sending out a, a general an email, kind of like you do for the general meetings. I'll be sending out an email next week to all of you so you have the first chance at taking a crack at some tickets. Um, as well as, you know, we do still have, even though we are going online, we do still have sponsorships available. So if you are interested in participating and getting that digital reach out there, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll go ahead and drop my email into the chat just in case you don't have it and i would i would love to chat with you about it awesome thank you and i would like to take this opportunity to publicly thank jill for all of the time effort and energy she has put into this in-person summit that is no longer going to happen um thank you for your flexibility and all of your hard work we all deeply appreciate you um thank you yeah give her a well, thanks, guys. And you know, it's the end of the day, it's it's bringing our family together and making sure that everybody is safe and happy and healthy. And I think that we will absolutely be able to do that and and throw a really amazing summit again this year. So I look forward to seeing everyone there. 
Um, okay, so um, a couple more items for uh, our board update. Um, we uh, were we got our check from the Chronic Relief Golf Tournament, um, and that tournament they donated a little over four thousand dollars to the Cannabis Alliance, which is fantastic, and we are deeply appreciative. So, um, if you see uh, David Tran or James Aldoni around, uh, please make sure you thank them on our behalf for their generosity. Um, the board has earmarked that donation for equity initiatives, and so we'll be able to share with you moving forward what the equity and justice. Justice Committee and the board um, has decided to do with those funds. But um, again, it was sort of an unexpected uh, line item in our budget, and, and that's where we decided we wanted to, to put that. So um, we will keep you updated. But uh, again, just a lot of gratitude towards the Chronic Relief folks and Fairchild for their generosity. Um, also, NCIA, the National Cannabis Industry Association, which is the um, federal industry organization that we frequently partner with um, to attend to federal issues has started their associations group up again. We've had two meetings, um, which included about 15 different states in both meetings to talk about what's happening on the federal stage. Um, yesterday in our meeting, we primarily talked about the um, Chuck Schumer, Cory Booker um, bill. And um, there are lots of conversations about things that we would like to see. Um, there's conversation about coming together as a group to sort of have agreement across states uh, to make sure that our voice is a strong one in this negotiation of what this bill actually looks like when it um, goes out to be voted on. However, the consensus is that this is a thing that is not going to be happening this year. So we do have some time for input um, and uh, we'll continue to do that. So um, if anybody has any thoughts, um, please go ahead and reach out to me. Obviously, these are still in the very early stages, so don't feel like it's a, a huge rush, but uh, any input at any time is, is always welcome. Um, we are putting together, uh, I've talked about it now, I think for two meetings in a row, but we will have um, our comprehensive survey out to the membership and to, the, to all licensees here in the next couple of weeks. We're starting to kind of um, fine tune it and, and get it out. So please do look for that in your email, but we will also be harassing you uh, pretty hard to make sure that we get your input on all of the topics facing the cannabis industry moving forward. Um, along those lines also, um, I have gotten a work group started um, with um, NCAA that includes California and um, you, Nebraska, I believe, uh, and New York, and then also the folks at NCAA to talk about synthetically derived cannabinoids and in particular addressing the, the separation of the quote marijuana plant and the quote hemp plant, by the way, they're the same plant, um, and uh, how we might address that at the federal level so that we can have um, clearer conversations that make a little bit more sense around synthetically derived cannabinoids and, and how we as an industry want to address those. Um, so I will keep you updated as that work group continues its work. All right. So I'm going to move on to um, just a really quick legislative update. As you know, we're in interim. And so um, at the state level right now, what we're talking about concerning legislation is legislators are now starting to look at their fall calendar and get ready. So we're just lining up meetings, um, paying attention to all of the legislation that we had from uh, last session as we move into this upcoming session. You will see some questions um, around some new possible legislation coming out of the patient committee, which will kind of keep in touch with as that starts to um, form and, and take shape. But, but other than that, this is the time where we're just laying groundwork. And I want to thank everybody who has been involved in each of those individual conversations and, and um, reaching out to your legislators. The work um, of the legislative committee will be starting um, in September. We'll have those applications out and we will seat the committee um, sometime in, in October. So that is an application process. It has more to do with just making sure our volunteers on that committee have enough time to be able to give rapid turnaround on, on feedback on our legislation. So if legislation is something that you are interested in getting more closely involved with, um, you can start thinking about that. Uh, once session starts, it's about five to 10 hours a week of your time, um, but start considering if that is a thing that you might be interested in. And at our next general meeting, we'll have those applications out and ready to go. 
Now, um, uh, on legislative, um, Jason Lammers, there you are. Are you able to give an introduction for our speaker today? Sure. Yeah, okay. Just wanted to make sure in the car. So perfect. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Jason Lammers, who is our board vice president and chair of our sustainability committee um, to give an introduction for our speaker today. Hi, everybody. Um, so we've asked Heather Trim from Zero Waste Washington to come by today and talk about Senate Bill 5022 uh, that was just passed in the legislative session uh, and signed by the governor's desk, I think in May. And so she's going to give an update on the uh, impact of that bill and how it may apply to our cannabis space. And uh, overall, we're really excited about this bill. I think it's a big uh, step in the right direction as far as sustainability goes. And uh, with that, I guess I'll just let Heather give uh, the rest of the details going forward. Thanks for joining us today, Heather. Okay, great. I need to share my screen, if, if you could let me do that. And how many minutes do, you, do I have? I prepared a PowerPoint. I could go longer or shorter, depending on what you got available. Oh, I can't hear you, Caitlin. Yeah, there we go. Um, how does 15, 20 minutes sound? That's good. I'll go as fast as I can, and then I can speed. Can you, can you give me like a three-minute warning when I'm near the end? Oh, oh yeah, please. absolutely. Um, and we'll shoot for 20, and then we'll, yeah. Okay, okay great. Okay, great. All right. Um, can you all see my screen? Can you see it? Great. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Well, I'm Heather Trim. I'm executive director of Zero Waste Washington, and I am so thrilled to work with you all. And I have been working um, with Jason and also with Kim over the years. So we are a statewide group that works to make um, trash obsolete. And we primarily do that by um, helping pass laws at the local and state level and federal level and do research and pilot projects. I'm not going to talk about all the things we do, but you can see those here on this slide. And um, we in particular work on product stewardship where the manufacturers, and that's all, that's many of your members, um, you know, pay for the end of life of products. And uh, this example here is medicine return. And starting last November, um, people could take their, um, pe people can now take their medicine, leftover medicine you have in your um, home to hospitals, pharmacies, and sheriff's offices. Um, it's called uh, MedPro and it's paid for by the, um, you know, all the pharmaceutical industry. And then similarly, if you have leftover paint, same thing, that kicked in in April. And these are the products that are taken in that. So I was just, that's a side advertisement. Um, so today, and this map I realized might be out of date because this is from last August, there could have been some updates in the most uh, recent legislative sessions. Um, I'm gonna talk about plastics, recycling, food waste and organic waste because I, these all actually connect with you all and then legislative session. Um, last session and then what we have planned for next session. And I, again, will go very quickly. So you all probably are very aware that we live in a plastics era. This is the, um, the uh, uh, landscape from uh, 1950 to 2015 and it's by sector. If you look at the blue at the bottom, that is packaging. And um, we are predicted to go way higher in our use of plastic. Um, this is what the petrochemical industry has basically projected for us. And um, that blue at the bottom of that first graph, 30% to 40% is of the plastic resin is used for packaging. It's a very broad category, everything from bottles to um, you know, uh, packaging for cannabis, to um, stickers, to candy bar wrappers, to the, the wrap around your tissue paper. It is a very, very broad um, category. And the problem we have right now is that a lot of it is um, not recyclable because it's multi-material. Um, these are every single example on this slide is multi-material and is not recyclable. The can in the lower right hand corner looks like it's a metal can, but it's actually plastic um, can with a metal top. And so because it's two materials, our system can't handle it. And these other pouches and things are multi laminate. The problem we have in Washington is that um, we have, um, we did have really great recycling and good costs. And we, this is um, in, since 2015, there's been a 36% increase in our unincorporated areas in the cost of recycling um, to our residents. And it's also decreased in terms of what they can recycle. And here's our, our chart over our, of our recycling rate. And you can see that it is quite um, sad that we got up to 56%. We we're one of the best in the country and we're dropping now. This is something we're trying to fix. The um, problem that happened, and we were basically for two 
decades, we were sending material to China. And this sort of, um, obs um, what's the word? Obs um, obliterated, it's not the right word, but anyway, it made it so that we couldn't actually see the true burden of recycling that we were, we, we've, it made us very sloppy in the United States and particularly in the Pacific Northwest. Up to 60% of our bales of various commodities were going to, um, were going to uh, uh, China and it was everything from textiles to plastics to glass, et cetera. And um, the, uh, sorry, I'm getting, getting hit here with something else. Um, the reason that we had this situation in part is because we, the Port of Seattle is a deadhead port. It is a place where the container ships were coming in full of lots of materials that were then going on rail to Chicago or the Midwest and going home largely empty. And so it became very, very, very inexpensive to take our, um, to take, to, it was super cheap to send bales of waste back to China. It was cheaper to send uh, the same bale of, say, plastic from Seattle to China by ship than from Seattle to Portland, Oregon. That's the dynamic. And think about that from a greenhouse gas perspective and think about that from a cost perspective. Things were messed up. China's now said no, and we now have a reckoning. And that's great because it's giving us the opportunity to really fix our recycling and our re waste reduction system here in the Pacific Northwest and create jobs as well. Okay, so people say, well, why do you even bother recycling? And this chart shows you the um, energy saved if you uh, recycle these different types of materials. And you can see, as you all have probably heard before, aluminum cans are the best in terms of saving energy, but plastics is actually second best. And this is new data. This is this is uh, current. This ISRI is a great website that really does, a, 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 I think, a very, very credible job of making this case. And so um, this is why we want to recycle plastic we want to reduce it in the first place. Glass, interestingly, comes out a little lower on this chart. Now, um, let me shift. I'm giving you just some background context before we start talking about bills. Um, let me shift to organics because you all are also in the organics business. And I thought you'd be interested in this. So right now, um, this is actually three years old. EPA said that um, the landfills in the United States are the third largest source of methane. This is now... That was 2018. And then in 2021, during the pandemic, they actually did in California some way better assessments where they did satellites from with NASA. And they came up with um, a rather different story, which is that the top emitters in California were in fact the landfills. And we think that's probably the case for, Cal for Washington state as well. This is a big, big problem. We, I'm a geologist by training. And if you're just sending all this organic waste to the landfill and it's rotting and it's creating methane, you can put some pipes in to try to get out some of the gas, but the reality is it's just a big mop of emitting gas, as you can imagine. So we need to get this handled. And um, the UN actually, well, you know, there was a big climate report that came out on Monday, but back in May, they came out with a major report on methane. Methane is considered a super emitter, meaning that if we can address methane quicker than CO2, if we can address it now, we can actually bend the climate change curve quicker and more effectively, and then get on that CO2 over a little bit more timeline. In other words, methane is something that is a, this report that came out from the UN said it is very addressable and it will make a very big difference if we really tackle methane. So hopefully I've made the case for you about methane. Um, the, um, the Department of Ecology does a re really fabulous report every five years. This is, it's called a waste characterization study and it's of the material going to our landfill, not composting, not recycling. This is their slide. And as you can see, 28.5% by weight of what's going to our landfills in Washington state is, um, is organic material. That's a lot. And that's actually the same that you'll see across the whole US. We've got to tackle this. It's, it's very tackable. Tack, tack, that's not the right word, but anyway, we can deal with it. We need to compost, we need to do anaerobic digestion. So we did a report on this topic over the past year. We published it in May saying, what can we do to expand our capacity for organic waste management? And we came up and we looked at um, kind of the current conditions. These are the current facilities around Washington state that address um, the do composting. These are the types of feedstock they take. Now, here's a question that you all, I think, could grapple with is, you know, what about the um, waste from your industry? And I know there's some barriers, but can we help work with you to address those barriers? Um, and then this is the flow of feedstocks from one county to another or from out of state into the state. So if you look at King County, you can see that it's tanner, darker tan, and it has a big old fat green arrow. 
that green arrow means that we are sending a lot of our feedstock in King County to Snohomish County. There are two major compost facilities there, Cedar Grove and um, Lens. So that gives you a sense of how things move around in our state right now in terms of feedstocks. Our report came up with 37 um, rec policy recommendations. I'm not gonna talk about them right now, but if you go online to our website and look under publications, you'll be able to read the report and see all the things that, that we heard from. We, we interviewed 61 different experts around the state of what can we do to expand our organics waste. Okay, so now let's get to what Jason asked me to talk about. Sorry, Jason. A little Actually, bit Heather, if you don't mind me interrupting, if you wouldn't mind going back to that previous slide from the report, and um, I think everybody would benefit from hearing maybe just a little bit more about that. Okay, if you have time. I just didn't yeah, want yeah. to. Yeah. I'm worried about time. No, uh, no, okay. no, no. Don't worry about time. Uh, I'll I'll help you out with that one. Okay, um, okay. Thank you. No, no, yeah. I'd love to talk more. I was just worried that I was being yeah. picky. Okay, no, so... Um, so what we did is we interviewed all these um, these experts around the state. We have major leaders in this field in Washington state. Some of them are international leaders. And we said, what would it take to expand our, our, our um, composting and our anaerobic digestion in Washington? And for those of you who don't know what anaerobic digestion is, that's where you take organic material, you put it essentially in a vessel, like a big tank, and you cook it, you let the microbes do its thing and it creates biogas. And that biogas can then be used to create electricity or to run um, um, industry and that kind of thing. So, um, so those are kind of the two major solutions other than reducing it in the first place. And so these, these are all done um, in terms of the categories. So for example, permitting, if you look at the dark blue on the bottom, we have a major problem that the permitting is a nightmare for people when they wanna make a new composting facility in Washington, there's probably Probably my guess is there's not so easy for uh, citing a new, new cannabis facility either. Um, but in any case, um, we had specific recommendations in terms of making it more like a one shop type thing. This is just like the very top um, recommendation there, making it easier to do permitting. Um, we have another problem, which is if you look at the, um, the uh, top uh, green, the darker green one, capacity and markets. We need to do a way better job of making sure that you have end markets for the compost and also for the gas. And there's some big barriers there in terms of how things are actually structured at the moment. And then um, in terms of toxics, we have, if you look at the thing on the, on the, the, the blue on the left, um, it says update our toxics list. So our compost right now does not, it's only tested for certain things um, to, before they sell it to the public or sell it to, to farmers. Um, certain sort of very old school things. And there's some new toxic chemicals like perfluorinate chemicals that are getting into the compost that should be included. Or for example, pesticides like chlorpyrrolus, chlor I'm not gonna pronounce it right, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pesticide that's used on hay. And then that gets into the compost and then that hurts the, if you're trying to grow new crops from that compost. So um, these are all fairly technical, but they're real problems. And that's what we're working on right now. And I'll talk about that in a minute in terms of the bill we're doing. To address these. Um, any questions on this before I move on? Happy to talk tons more. Um, okay, so in terms of legislative session, last session we actually did have six bills that passed. I'm not going to talk about all these, I'm just showing you that there were there was a, a nice selection of, of zero waste bills that did pass. And um, in terms of addressing the plastics and recycling crisis, we, um, Zero Waste Washington, but also many of our partners, have a two-pronged approach. One, reduce the use of unnecessary plastics. Just don't have them in the first place. Um, bring your own, etc. Or, and like reuse, can we have reusable glass tubes, for example, in your, in your industry? Um, and then also let's, if, for the stuff that we are going to recycle, let's make sure we really are recycling it in Washington state and creating jobs here and that it's really recyclable. So the bill that passed was led by Senator Mona Das, and um, it was in the Senate and then in the House, um, Rep. Liz Berry helped shepherd it when it got over to the House. And it, what it did is it bans expanded polystyrene food service products um, and it bans um, coolers like these kind of recreation coolers and it bans packing peanuts. Um, so it has different time schedules for those. And then it also has an ask first component. So if, if you're a food establishment, come January 1, 2022, so only um, five months from now, six months from now. Um, if you're a restaurant, you have to ask first if it's to go where before you get um, utensils, which includes things like um, splash sticks, straws, condiment, uh, condiment packages, and um, beverage cup lids for cold beverages. So this is very exciting because this is gonna save businesses money 
And also, you know, who of you, like me, has a drawer full of forks in your kitchen that you really don't need, plastic forks? Then this directly impacts you all. Um, so this is um, a recycled, minimum recycled content requirements for different types of things. And there are three different things. I'm going to explain them in one by one. But this one, I do believe you have infused drinks. And it is saying that um, by January 1, 2023, the, those bottles, which are usually PET plastic, need to have 15% recycled content um, for uh, before uh, uh, if they're going to be sold in Washington State. And um, many of the, the manufacturers who make the bottles that you buy um, or your industry buys are already you know, doing a very good job of creating the sustainability kind of pathway. There are exemptions or temporary exemptions for various reasons. So there's a lot of detail that goes in behind that in terms of exemptions and things. The second category, uh, and by the way, all these major companies have made promises that they're gonna do 100% recycled content, et cetera. So we're basically putting it in statute. Naked is already there. They already are using 100% recycled content. The whole point of this is to make value in the recycling stream. So it's valuable to recycle things because you're gonna need that resin to recycle and make a new bottle. The second category, and this is first in the world, was the same thing, recycle content for personal care and cleaning products in the home. So household products like shampoos and lotions and also like detergents and cleansers. And then lastly, um, recycle content requirements for bags because this is actually low hanging fruit. A lot of bags already have recycled content and um, our goal is to basically, again, push it forward. So then um, let's talk, and I'll take tons of questions if you have them in a minute, but let me just get through next year. So looking ahead to next year, we are working on four different bills that all probably relate to you all one way or the other, um, but I'm only gonna talk about a couple of them. Okay, so the first one is packaging, um, which I'll talk about first, and then right to repair, which has to do with letting people repair things um, with the specs, the tools, and the um, parts from the manufacturers, and you pay for that. But right now, it, if you're an independent um, repair shop, it's very difficult, impossible for you to get the manufacturer's stuff. You have to get aftermarket stuff, and they um, we want to open that up. Um, and then battery extended producer responsibility. So the battery manufacturers paying for the end of life of batteries. And Jason and I have talked about this in the past because some things do have some cannabis related products, of course, have batteries in them. And then the organics and methane bill, a mega bill that we're working on. So let's start with the packaging omnibus bill. So what we're doing is we're working on a bill to, um, to have the manufacturers pay for the end of life of what goes into your blue bin right now. So everything in a residential blue bin, like your paper, your plastic, your metal, and your glass. And this is based on a report that was required um, by a bill that Senator Roth has championed a couple of years ago, 15, SB 5397, and it made recommendations, 10 recommendations. I don't expect you to read them all, but the number one there you can see is extended producer responsibility for all packaging. And that's the bill that we're working on right now for a session. This is not a new idea. Across um, the world, you can see where it's blue, there's been quite a few producer responsibilities put in for these materials, these recyclable um, packaging type materials. And um, in Germany, it started in the early 1990s. It was called the Green Dot Program. And here in the United States, um, last the, over this past year, so in 2021 session, um, 11 states have introduced bills. We did it, we introduced a bill as well. We pivoted, but we did introduce a bill and two have passed and just been signed by their governors in the last few weeks. So that's Maine and Oregon. So we have some momentum going on these bills as we move into um, legislative session. And the goal here is the manufacturers and the brand owners would pay for the packaging and paper products at the end of life. And so some of your members will be some of these um, uh, brands and, and manufacturers. And it's based on the Recycle BC model of um, that's been a very, very successful um, program, although we're, we're also looking at some of the criticisms and addressing some of the, the, the areas where there's not enough transparency and things like that. They actually, this slide's actually out of date. As of a week ago, they announced that their rate um, in, in 2019 was 85%. So I showed you before our recycling rate, which is down below 50% and converging to 44% they are up at 85% for the same suite of materials. And so the, the goal is to shift the cost of recycling from the ratepayers to back up the chain to the manufacturers, and then to motivate the manufacturers 
to make materials that are recyclable, reusable, or compostable. So we would love, and I know there's some barriers to this right now, but we would love for you to be able to have reusable packaging that people can bring back in and then get washed and then reused again. Um, that seems so natural for your industry and it's sort of frustrating that there's barriers to that. So we wanna work to help address some of those barriers with you all. Okay, so now let's, let's, let's move on to the other mega bill, which is organics. And Cinder Doss is going to be the champion of this. This is the bill that she dropped last year to get the conversation going. Dropped means introduced. And um, what we're looking at is a ban on the organic material going to the landfill. Um, so these are the states where you see different types of bans. Um, you know, kind of crazy that Washington isn't even on this list. I mean, look at all the yard waste bans that are already in place and then food waste bans. And then um, what we're doing is we're basing this on California's bill that passed five years ago. So it's SB 1383. And what they're saying, and this is a methane, this is a climate change bill, and this is the way we're framing ours. Um, and we hope you all will join us. Um, short-lived pollutants, so like methane, it's a short-lived super emitter pollutant, as are hydrofluorocarbons and anthropogenic black carbon. And the main thing to note here is in that gray box, the goal is to reduce the amount of organic material in California is 75% by 2020. Now we would obviously have it be more like 75% by 2030 because we're starting now with our bill, we're five years behind them. But the point is, is that um, this is what we need to do. We need to take the step to actually say we're banning it and now we've got to figure out a way to compost it or do other things with that material. And of course we want to include all organic material. So overall our hierarchy is Let's prevent the waste in the first place, then let's do reuse, then recycling, and then only if we must, recovery and, and, re and landfill, which we really don't, we're, we're trying to get away from. And I will stop sharing there. Hopefully that was timely, <laughs> Time fast enough. I do, I talk fast when I'm trying to go fast. I was gonna say, Heather, that was really darn impressive. That was a ton of fantastic information very quickly. Um, so I do wanna make sure that we have some time here now for um, questions um, from the audience. <clears throat> I was kind of keeping an eye on the chat. Um, let's see, also just uh, so everybody knows in the chat, there is the link to Zero Waste Washington um, that was provided to you. Um, we do have a question about the charts. Uh, gosh, it was back before we got to the legislative part um, using CO2E or methane directly um, in parentheses 21 times CO2 for um, all of us that geek out on emissions. So it was the emission slide uh, regarding methane and CO2. Okay, so I'm, I'm not, can you repeat what the question actually is? I think I missed, or was it a comment? Uh, it was a question about, did in those charts for the CO2, did you use CO2E or methane directly? And I'm trying it to- was, think It was it. regarding the uh, California study. Oh yeah, thanks Kyle. Oh, the, say, California, Kyle, take over. the California satellite <laughs> study. Um, I do not know. I do not know what they did. That's a very good question. So you're above my, um, my uh, brain level on that one. Good question, though. Yeah, yeah it's, very good question. Well, if it's methane, the, 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 the big question is, if it's methane, it's actually 21 times worse than CO2 emissions. Yeah, oh, so that chart was methane, yes. Um, and you're right. The thing about methane, and that's why it's a super emitter, is that over a 20-year period, it's 84 times worse than CO2, and then over a 100-year period, it's something else. So that's why it's got this, um, it's this short-lived aspect to it. Um, and thank you also, Kyle, for sharing some additional resources um, on farm power. And that looks like Jason has a, class, a question. Any plans to address small packages that are recyclable, but too small right now for the recyclers? Yeah, so that's an issue right now that um, things that are less than three inches um, fall through the cracks in the recycling system. And um, if you've ever been to a recycling facility, they have these big rollers and they're three inches apart. And that's why you're not supposed to put lids and things down in there. So that's why in a way, if you all could have um, return bins at your business, I don't know who's a business, if your members could have um, return bins at your business, that would get customers in the door for you. And then you could directly recycle things that normally fall through and go into the landfill because it's called the residual. It falls on the floor at the recycling facilities and then they scoop it up and send it to the landfill. So that's that three inch thing. Um, but my my favorite idea for you all would be that you have glass or, or things that are washable 
that you could have people you sell in and then people bring back. And also for your pouches to have them not be multi-laminate, but to be one material mono material so that they can be recycled because that's a huge problem as well for your industry. Wonderful. Uh, any other questions for Heather? We'd love to have you all work with us as we move into session. Yes, thank you so much, Heather. And um, thank you for addressing so many of the things that the, the Sustainability Committee in particular is working on concerning bio waste and battery reclamation and safety. Um, so thank you, Jason, uh, for also bringing Heather to our meeting today and to the Sustainability Committee for all of the work that you do for our industry. Okay, well, I will say goodbye. And, um, and then um, Jason and I will be in touch as to next steps in terms of um, how the bills develop and if you guys want to have input and that kind of thing. And we love your support. Wonderful. You Thank thought. you. Bye bye. Thanks. Heather. Ooh, well, I am delighted to have gotten my education for the day <laughs> um, and so compactly as well. Uh, I'll be processing that for a little bit. So I will also ask a request that we uh, get a copy of that slideshow because um, there was a ton of great information in there so that we can make that av available to all of you as well. I personally would love to review it um after that so we're going to shuffle around our normal um structure of things and we're actually going to move to um our committee updates before we get to our regulatory update um because one of our committees is our hemp committee that um is has taken the show on the road to um new mexico so we're just going to accommodate different time zones today so jerry i'm going to turn it over to you thanks for joining us from uh new mexico uh, turn your mute off, though. Can gotcha. you hear me now? We can. Thank you. Hi. So um, <clears throat> my apologies for seeming absent uh, as the hemp person uh, within the alliance. I've actually been really busy both in Washington and here in New Mexico. And for those who um, have been following, um, I uh, am working with a first grade pal growing hemp uh for fiber here in um, guadalupe county new mexico uh he's a paper maker and has worked with hemp fiber i've grown in um, washington to the point where he can make 100 percent hemp paper uh, with stuff that i pre-process without the tacoma aroma so there are several things i'd like to <clears throat> give you updates on so i'm playing the hemp game with partner farms in washington uh under the department of ag washington department of ag rules but also while the license is in Jonas's names for a reason I'll touch on briefly, uh, we're 50-50 growing fiber down here. So one thing I'd like to bring to people's attention is that the Department Ag is putting together a voluntary hemp processor registration, which requires a business entity, not an individual, and a physical address. And what it gives you is the paperwork uh, from the Department of Ag that says, Yes, this is a hemp product this, per, this company has created that gives you the paper trail to, to move it across state and country lines much easier. So it's voluntary, details are on the website. Um, uh, one of the things I've been quietly uh, stewing away on is this issue of hemp farms, cannabis farms, and dual licenses, and where people growing hemp and cannabis on the same farm. The major concern is pollen, which is a concern because it travels if you're an outdoor grower. The other issue is um, a little bit more complicated in that um, uh, I, I'm of the school of thought that this is going to become a commodity industry, and I want to help preserve small cannabis and hemp farms uh, uh, locally, uh, family-owned, uh, artisan, uh, niche, what have you. And so getting uh, hemp and cannabis farmers to get along is really important because both industries, because they do merge and overlap, are, um, are in the same bed. Uh, there's less of an adversarial approach than working together, uh, <clears throat> number one. Uh, but number one, point one is eventually federal restrictions and limitations on hemp and cannabis will disappear timetable who knows but we should all prepare for the day when there's a unified cannabis sativa l market right now everything is cbd oriented and one of the things i'm um, 
working with the New Mexico Department of Agriculture is I'm growing fiber and it's a monaceous cultivar, which means there are male and female flowers on each and every plant. It isn't like Oh, darn, Jerry, we lost you. Give him a second. The hazards of uh, reporting in from the field, I guess, hey? All right, um, Jerry, if you're able to hear me, um, we are going to move on to the other committees, but happy to loop back around so that you can complete your thoughts. Oh, maybe. No. Uh, here am I. Here am I back? Yes, you are. Hello? Okay, yep. cool. Okay, sorry about that. I'm in my truck in the farm. It's a little goofy. Um, so really, I'm trying to build a framework both in New Mexico, where it's going to be a bit, little bit easier. It's a smaller, um, less involved market, uh, and Washington State as well as national. To that end, um, I've written a couple of columns for Northwest Leaf I'd like to bring your attention to. While it's headlined as a hemp column, I'm addressing the cannabis sativa L industry in general. In April, I had one entitled um, a Collision Course, where I talk about um, the truce that needs to happen between everyone growing cannabis, whatever cultivar or industry it's oriented towards. And then the August one is a terroir as brand. I am working with uh, Luke Zimmerman, a lawyer in Portland, uh, international botany law uh, around um, marketing craft cannabis and smokable hemp as terroir to brand it by your locale, by your microclimate and allowing people to segment the market by adding um, recognition and brand to where it's grown and how it's grown, just like wine and, and <clears throat> wine grapes and a lot of other things that uh, like I'm sitting here now in what used to be a tomato and chili farm. I'm in New Mexico, I'm in Guadalupe County, 120 miles east of Albuquerque. So, um, uh, and I bring that to your attention because uh, Luke and I had an hour long conversation two days ago and we agreed to start co-writing papers because we think we've come up a way. The problem is the US didn't sign the treaties to allow us to use Appalachians or DOC or any or ABAs. And Humboldt and the wine country, there's a resistance to having cannabis associated geographically with a well-established wine industry. And there's uh, mixed feelings, to put it lightly, among uh, uh, the wine industry in Northern California, which geographically overlaps the, um, the cannabis industry. And they think that we give them a black eye by um, using county designations, you know, AVAs, American uh, Viniculture uh, areas. So um, uh, I think that's the last. Oh, so to the idea of the co peaceful coexistence of hemp and cannabis farmers. With the Alliance's no full knowledge and, and permission, I would like to do a mailing, an emailing to all of the hemp and cannabis licensees, asking them to submit, to, to have, give their input to this issue of how we're gonna have um, farms, either single license or dual licenses, uh, how, how people envision that future going forward. Um, and whether it comes to me or to the Alliance directly, uh, I would encourage some to, um, uh, submit anonymously if they if they so desire, uh, but there needs to be a um, a dialogue back and forth because it will happen. And the reason people have such wonderful sunsets in Seattle is because of folk, uh, of smoke from hundreds of miles away. So to think that a three versus a ten mile barrier between farms outdoors is ludicrous. So uh, it's you know, it's been done for other crops. It needs to have a conversation around what goes on here in Washington. So that's what I'm doing. And I'm, you know, trying to grow fiber down here. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Jerry. Um, and absolutely, I'm gonna...
put you on mute because I've got weird feedback of my voice coming through your phone, then back at here into the Zoom. Um, but unmute yourself when you're ready to talk again. Um, so the um, thank you. And I think bringing uh, everybody growing the sativa plant together uh, is a critical step to starting um, really important conversations so that we come to the table knowledgeable and with power as we are addressing um, the federal regulations, particularly around separating these two categories of industry that are artificial when it comes to actually the plant itself. Um, so thank you for your leadership on that, Jerry, um, very much so. And just leadership in general. Thanks for being a trailblazer. Yeah, go ahead and unmute, I'll stop talking. Almost. It's harder on your phone. I know. How about now? Okay, so um, um, I will be putting out a bunch of content. Luke and I are going to co-write a paper that talks about what needs to be done to brand uh, craft cannabis and smokable hemp uh, to make everybody happy. Um, I have brought on two people, uh, two very competent women to help at LeBlanc so that I can focus on bigger things than shipping orders. Uh, and, um, and instead of just talking about it, we really are, this is the first great friend of mine who has a paper making studio. And we're doing this thing that has no Tacoma aroma. And we're doing a, um, a video series called From Seed to Paper. Oh, so here, these are my, I can't do the chat, but this is what I got. These are the two URLs you can use to keep up to date with what we're doing. And um, uh, Pam West and I are doing a, uh, a new podcast called The Hemp Kite. And it doubles up with um, what uh, we call From Seed to Paper. Uh, episode eight goes up tonight and I record episode nine as well. But uh, we're having a good time. We're doing some really cool shit and it is hot as the dickens down here. Bye. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry, throw that back up for one more second. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Joe will, will get the URL going. So leave that on up and um, we'll get the URL in the chat so that you Thank can you. paste. Yeah, of course. Thank you. All right. Um, so other committees. Um, let's see. Our education committee, Trey, um, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Yes, thank you. I'm uh, very pleased to help co-lead the education committee with Lana Care, and uh, we just had a meeting this week, so a little update from that. We, you all made, I know you know, because we've talked about our cannabis book initiative, and boy, we've learned a lot about library services because we thought that if we asked you for uh, donations of books and we got those commitments, we'd just donate those books directly, directly to the library, get them on the shelves, and that's the best way to provide some balance because we found out, you know, or as you might expect, a lot of the books for children and young adults are just full of reefer madness, you know, publication dates in the 40s and 50s with the same messaging that you would expect. So we were wrong. Uh, we learned from libraries in Washington, at least, if you say King County, if you donate a book to King County libraries, they will turn around and have a book sale with that donation. It doesn't go on the shelf. And so typically the process in this state is you go to that county library, you make a request for purchase. It helps if you're already a member of that library so you can use your library card. So it ensures that it's locals making these requests. And then those go on the shelf once purchased if approved. So um, we thank you for those of you who have already dedicated or committed to buying a book. Um, but we're going to change direction and for the good. So we asked our committee members to adopt a county. Um, typically, it's a county where they lived or went to school. And so there's some connection there. And then we're taking that curated list that we've shared with you in the past and then recommending those books, anything that's not already on the shelf, to be purchased by those library systems. So it's a lot more local approach. We think it'll be a more effective approach. And, um, and we want to shout out to Jen Chan, who is one of those people who committed books and in this case committed two copies of If a Peacock Finds a Pot Leaf, a beautiful children's illustrated children's book. And um, so those are going to find their first home with Cedar, um, with Lana's finding a home with the Jamestown Scholem Tribe Library. And then she's using the other one 
to, as an example, as she goes and makes personal connection with the Knowles system library up in, in their area. So we're really excited about that. And so if you did commit to buy a book, um, we're still going to, we're still going to call on you, but in a different way. So, um, so hold on to those commitments and, and we will reapproach you with a slightly uh, different tact on that. But we, uh, we think it's a good effort and we think, uh, we hope that we're going to be contributing to some, putting some good published work on the shelves that is not just free for medicine. It helps people understand cannabis is medicine and that's why their parents use it or it's why grandma is, is, is not walking with her cane this month or, or whatever the case might be. Um, we want to appreciate um, another education effort is we had developed a Cannabis 101 presentation with the community in mind, knowing that a lot of communities, uh, a lot of members even in Washington State still don't know near as much as we do collectively at the Alliance about cannabis. So we created a 101 presentation and um, we're going to present that even though you all are a high cannabis IQ audience on webinar Wednesday on the 25th. That's the last Wednesday of this month. And we think this is a great opportunity for you to bring a friend to webinar Wednesday. And so if you have a, um, a parent, a family member, a friend who you feel like you're always kind of preaching to or trying to convert or help understand, let us help you do that and bring them to webinar Wednesday on that last Wednesday of the month, because this will be a very elementary kind of foundations level conversation. But even if you think you know it all about cannabis, we encourage you to come and uh, because there might be some stuff in there historically, legally, otherwise, social, social impact stuff that we might be able to help polish up some details on. So we appreciate both Nancy Southern and Lana Kerr, who are going to be facilitating that conversation, conversation and want to appreciate Morgan Worley for many hours committed to editing and uh, helping us come up with um, Good narratives for each slide, presentation notes, and that sort of thing. So thank you to all of you. And then uh, we'll also be taking that show on the road. Angela Williams at Skagit Organics has been talking to a number of retailers who are interested in um, in helping us get that message out to some more information coming on that. Um, Lana also discussed an interest saying that, you know, um, if you're not aware, the Jamestown Scallum tribe opened Cedar Greens Cannabis in the Squim area and a fantastic medically endorsed store who not only has a focus on patients but has a pharmacist that works with them periodically to help those patients which is which is unique in the space so uh, but she mentioned you know that some of the the tribal leaders although they appreciate having the the store don't fully appreciate the positive impact to the community and she said you know I wish that we could help them better understand that so what what we're going to do is we're going to work with her, work with her pharmacist, and now a commitment with, from Dr. Uma Danabalan to be an advisor for us on this project to develop a short survey that they can encourage their consumers to take. Um, it's a pilot study just to get some information about, hey, cannabis has helped me in this way. I take less pharmaceuticals. Um, do I maybe drink or smoke less? Am I sleeping better? I have less pain. All those kind of things encapsulated, short form. Um, so that she could take some of that information back to her community and say, hey, look, not only is the shop popular, but this is what we're hearing from consumers. So our hope is that that goes well and we're able to collect some information for their community and then use that as a pilot program and I'll encourage other retail establishments to do the same. We'll give them the tools and, and provide data back to them, all the while compiling a bigger data set for us that we can share legislatively, we can share in the stories that we tell, we can share as memes or social uh, media, many bytes of information. So we're excited about that. So we look uh, look forward to hearing more from uh, that effort. And I want to give a shout out too to all the, the Alliance's efforts to support Last Prisoner Project. Um, if you're not familiar with LPP.org, we encourage you to check them out. Um, as they say, it's it, one of the biggest crimes is that People are making life savings in this industry while others are serving life sentences. Uh, keep in mind there are between 40 and 50,000 cannabis prisoners in jail today. And so uh, we want to appreciate the, the Alliance for the efforts that they have made um, as we have also collaborated with the Academy of Cannabis Science to um, do a monthly webinar, teaching, symposium kind of thing with really sharp people throughout the industry 
And so we've, we've been pleased to have a number of panelists from the Alliance help to sponsor that or help to be on board and part of that brain trust as we reach out to constituents in their Prisoners to Prosperity program. So we're really proud of the Alliance and the, the leadership they're taking to, to look out for prisoners in this way. And keep in mind, LPP has some great programs that you can participate in both as an individual and as a licensee. So we encourage you to go to their website and look at their partner programs and I'll post the, the link to that. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of our education committee members who are just awesome. I didn't name you all, but they're fantastic folks. And thanks for your volunteer time. Thank you so much, Trey. Um, holy crap, like a ton of fantastic work happening in the education committee. Um, but guess what? All of our committees are actually doing fantastic work. And um, I love how the cross-pollination happens as well um, mm -hmm. between committees. So I would like to just take this moment as we are basking in the glow of the extraordinary work of the education committee um, to encourage you, if you are not in, on a committee, um, to find one that sort of suits your uh, interests and, and, and a project you'd like to work on um, within the industry, because we got a lot of great work going on right now. Um, along those lines, um, John Kingsbury, our chair of of our patient caucus. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Why don't you share what's going on with the patient committee? Okay, let me post something here real quick, just because I'm going to bring it up. Um, okay, so I'm going to burn through some stuff here pretty quick because I have a number of things I want to talk about. So uh, if I go too fast or too slow, let me know. Um, I want to uh, start with two expressions of gratitude. Uh, first, I really appreciate as, an ind as a largely industry group that uh, the uh, Cannabis Alliance gives patients a space. We often don't get any space at all or any bandwidth. So I wanna, I wanna tell this whole group how much I really appreciate that. Um, it's, it's very important. Um, the other expression of gratitude I'd like to give is, is um, the effort of this, um, organization on home grow. You guys have just stepped up in such a huge way. And I know you're not supposed to talk about uh, recreational home grow in the context of, of medical care, but I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. And I'll tell you what one of my major motivations is, is that I really feel strongly like um, the further LCB is away from my medical access, the better. So that's a strong part of, of my motivation there on home grow. Again, it, it's generally not the discussion you take to the legislature because you don't want to create confusion. But um, Laura stepped up, the organization stepped up, Al stepped up, uh, Hawthorne has really stepped up. And I just want to tell you how much I, I really respect and appreciate that. Um, so um, I do want to bring up uh, this is a little later down the year. I do also want to express appreciation for the support for HB 1105. That's the affirmative defense bill. Right now, if I jump through all the hoops as a patient, um, I that gives me an affirmative defense. That means I can still be arrested. I'm still subject to probable cause searches, but I can prove that I am um, innocent in a court of law. And that's not a good way to treat sick people especially for a substance that we sell like beer. Um, so um, I'll bring that back up later in a number of months, but um, the, the Alliance has really pushed um, their advocacy of that. And to me, just treating patients as human beings and not as criminals, I think is, is a really important value. So um, uh, if you go to the link that I put in the chat, um, there's a survey monkey survey um, and it's for patients. And I'm going to recruit some of the members of uh, this group, um, specifically retailers or if you have contact with patients. If you look at that, what you'll find is that it gives a lot of information for um, all, all sorts of aspects. It is titled, How is Medical Cannabis, uh, Washington's Medical Cannabis System Working for Patients? And what I will, it informs the work that I do. Um, I use it a lot when it goes, when I go talk to legislators and regulators. Um, you can see it is the last time I really updated it from top to bottom was 2019. 
Um, and I'm gonna spend some time this summer updating it again. Um, what I would really like to get from the members of the Alliance, especially the retailers or the people with contact with patients, is I would like a lot bigger sampling rates for patients. What happens is patients go to the Survey Monkey and they answer these questions about their experience, because I know what mine is. When I do advocacy work or we talk in the patient, um, uh, the patient committee, I like a broader view because my view of the world isn't the broader patient view. You know, they're quite, patients are quite diverse. And so I want um, to, to get the broadest um, selection of patients so we can make sure that we're looking at as many um, of the patient experiences as we can. So I'm, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna to get to a point in this. I've gotten a lot of feedback on how to reformat that. So if, if you've uh, given me feedback there, I really appreciate it because I've gotten a lot of excellent suggestions. But this, this one document is very critical for my advocacy, for the advocacy of the patient caucus, for educating legislators and regulators and making sure everybody in the patient community is well represented. So I'm gonna end up going to the retailers I'm going to go through membership and I will probably send you an email saying, here's a survey. Can you help me out with this? So what I'm trying to, the seed I'm trying to plant today is to say, if you get this, it's really critically important. It isn't a, it isn't a junk email. And, and I hope that you'll, uh, I hope that you'll give it attention. If you know patients or if you have consultants in your store, um, I want to make them all aware that this exists. I would like to have an incredible response rate. You know, instead of 200 people, you know, it'd be great to have 600. So uh, we make sure that we have the best information. And I think sample size is the way to get the best information. So I'm bringing that to your attention. Um, uh, somebody mentioned that we're going to have a legislative questionnaire coming up soon. Um, I've been... Um, I've been talking with Matt and some of the people in the patient caucus about a very specific sort of direct sales for concentrates. I don't think it's been nailed down what that looks like yet. Uh, I think feedback from membership is really, really important. So I'm gonna just at least draw this to your attention and let you know that this is coming. Um, and I've been told uh, by Matt that we're gonna, we'll have some questions for membership so we can get your view on what this should or shouldn't be. Um, I have to tell you as a patient, I'm often really, um, suspicious is a strong word, but I'm, uh, I'm very reticent when business comes and says, we have this idea for patients because we've sort of been run over that way. I like to, I, I prefer that patients go and say, how this is what we need and then business can come in and say here's how this can work for us too um, matt came to me with he sort of threw this idea on the table and i immediately looked at it and said you know this might um this might be a way to sort of attack some uh, problems that i'm really really aware of so i'm kind of a even though it started the other way around i'm kind of enthusiastic about its potential but it's not a fully formed idea and we'd really like your feedback to make sure that that happens. So I'm giving you a heads up too that this is coming. Uh, I wanna bring up two more um, things. One is um, if you have a retail store uh, and you have, you have a medical endorsement, uh, it was brought to my attention a couple of weeks ago that um, uh, as of January, 2020, uh, something was done to the law, which seems to say that uh, patients right now, if you're in the database, there's not a lot of us or a lot of patients who are in the database, but um, they get a sales tax discount. Uh, um, the, uh, in, as of January 2020, the, the best feedback I can get is that that law was changed the interpretation in 2016 was that would apply to all products in the store, basically saying that any product in the store is a medical product. Um, 
As of 2020, it looks like the language that was put into the RCW would mean that only DOH compliant product would qualify. So patients would lose that sales tax exemption on any product. Um, and there's other things in there like uh, low THC products also that, are, that would be included. Um, that could be a huge change. Um, I've asked for clarification from Department of Revenue. Um, so don't be surprised when this talk comes up. I've been spending a lot of time trying to get feedback from everybody's points of view. We will talk about that more in the patient caucus tomorrow, but be aware that it looks like there was a change in legislation um, that should have taken effect on January, 2020. I've talked to relay, retailers. They tell me they still give uh, registered patients sales tax deductions on any product in the store, but I have asked for clarification uh, from Department of Revenue and I've talked to Department of Health about it and just be aware that this is an issue out there. Um, the last thing is uh, back in December, 2018, I filed a um, petition with Department of Health about medical cannabis consultant training. And this was as a result of my first, how was medical cannabis working for patient survey. And what I discovered back then is that consultants seem to have really, or at least they did then, a very weak background of knowledge. Um, so I filed this petition uh, for rulemaking to Department of Health. That was December 8, 2018. Um, that was a long time ago. I am told um, by Department of Health that there should be a CR 102 on that petition uh, coming up soon. I haven't seen it. Uh, I have heard that before, so I'm not exactly holding my breath, um, but I'm uh, letting you know that, uh, especially if you're a retailer or uh, if you know certified consultants, or in Trey's case, if you train certified consultants, I will let people know that 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 CR 102 has come out. Uh, it, it, I'll try to make it something you don't have to discover yourself. <laughs> um, and be aware that's an issue. And we will talk a bit about that again tomorrow during the patient committee meeting, which is at 1.30. And everyone is uh, welcome to attend. I think that's everything on my list. Do you have questions? No, thank you so much, John, for all of those good um, heads ups. And just can you say one more time, the meeting you said tomorrow, one o'clock, how would folks find the link? 1.30. Um, so um, how would you find the link? Well, um, let me dig up a link and I will post Got it you. Here. Give me your... Do you have <laughs> Till that Till of Links is on it. There okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, there is a question in the chat. Thank you, Kim, for um, bringing that to my attention. Um, Nancy's asking if you are not if you are not on the registry officially um, or specifically identify yourself as a quote patient, but still do use cannabis um, uh, medically or therapeutically, is this survey for you to fill out, or should you shy away? Uh, so that is an excellent question. And uh, so, if you self-identify as a patient. So if you look at the survey that I posted, you will see three cat uh, you'll see one question where it says, are you a patient in the registry? Are you a patient that holds an authorization or are you a patient that hold neither, holds neither? So you determine whether or not you're a patient. The way we sort of ferret that out later is it'll ask what your conditions are and those are restricted to the qualifying conditions in the law, although there is another column so we'll be able to figure out who you are. So the short answer is yes. If you self-identify as a patient, a cannabis patient, we definitely want your feedback. Because we also want to know how many people uh, feel like they're using this for um, medical purposes, but have not engaged in the system. That's a really critical thing to know. So it's important that if you haven't engaged in the system, we're still aware that you're out there. 
Perfect. Thank you, John. And I have to say, um, really, any assistance you can get in getting this into the hands of as many people as you possibly can, please do. Um, I cannot tell you how many times um, in both the regulatory environment and the legislative environment I hear, hey, do you have a copy of John's study by any chance? Do you have a copy of John's survey questions? Can you pass me on? So um, it's important to update now at this time, and it's important to have as quality a data as we can possibly get in any assistance. Um, um, goes a really long way to all of those important conversations we have about uh, laws and regulations moving forward. So thank you, John. All right. Um, a couple of other quick committee updates. I think now is a good time to remind you our meetings are scheduled from 12 until 2, but um, we recognize that two hours is a bit. Um, these are always recorded and um, will be up on YouTube by the end of the week. Um, so if you came in late or have to drop early, um, you can always catch the rest of the meeting on YouTube shortly after. Um, the Community Engagement Committee. So that committee went dark for a little while. Um, however, um, after several months of hiatus, the Community Engagement Committee will be meeting again on the first and third Thursday of the month from three to four. The next meeting will be on August 19th. Um, it'll be a great opportunity to regroup, um, pick up where things were left off and make any readjustments. Um, since uh, the time that had been off. The agenda and Zoom link um, are going to be uh, put out on Friday. Um, so you can email Josh um, and Jill's getting that link into the, the chat um, uh, before then, if you would like to, to chat or check in with him and um, looking forward to, to getting that work back up and running. Um, and then I also want to um, give a plug for the Equity and Justice Committee. Um, they had a great uh, webinar not too long ago about clearing the record. Uh, well, the replay of that will be uh, again in um, September. Is that correct? Yes. So, guys, I don't know where the summer went. Like it's really um, upending to think that we're in the middle of August already. Um, at any rate. Um, uh, the one of the panelists there was Tara Simmons, who is a representative and also the director of Civil Survival, which is another group that we work with um, concerning um, prisoner rights uh, and its relationship to cannabis. And um, she is a confirmed keynote speaker for the summit. Uh, the committee uh, meets every other Wednesday at 3.30. And the next meeting will be the 25th um, at 3.30. And you can reach out to um, Jill or our committee chair is Yoko Miyashita or um, Jessica Pichardo uh, to get the details on how you can attend those meetings. All right. And not a committee, but a very valued partner. Um, Neil, would you like to talk about the cleanups and give any full spectrum updates? Yeah, hey friends. Uh, my name is Neil. I'm the founder and board president of the Full Spectrum. Um, uh, we've talked about it a couple times in these meetings and uh, as well as within happy hour. But um, this summer we have been collaborating with Hemp Fest to do all of these cleanups in neighborhoods all around Washington, all over the place. And we we just did one on Tuesday evening, did Rainier Avenue um, over in Columbia City it was really great to do the South End. But we have six coming up, which I've just posted in the chat. Um, all of the Facebook links to them, as well as the um, link to our registration, greatgreensweep.com. And um, yeah, we have... Uh, um in about a, next yeah next weekend um we're going to be doing lake city tacoma and capitol hill on that saturday and then west seattle gig harbor and muckle teo on that sunday um most of these events might have unofficial after party situations happening um so yeah 
but that's neither here nor there. Um, we are very grateful for our sponsors and collaborators, the Cannabis Alliance, Washington Bud Co. and Budget Dumpster. There's going to be some more announced soon. But if you are interested in sponsoring, there is still time. You can contact Eric, who is on this call, over at sponsorship at hempfest.org, which is dropped in the chat. Or you can donate directly on our website, greatgreensweep.com. Um, so yeah, those are coming up really great, really soon. Super excited about all that. And while I'm here, I also want to mention tomorrow night, we're going to be having a smoke sesh for the full spectrum. It's LGBTQ and ally cannabis industry professionals and community. Um, so this is just something that we've done periodically as well. But this one, we're doing a very special situation, a conversation and demo on edibles. And we're going to have some um, guests from the medical uh, market who are going to be here doing, um, do, having a little chat session, Peggy Button and Sage Amdahl. Um, and so I've dropped the Facebook event for that, as well as the Zoom link and the meeting ID and all of that for the Zoom. So that's going to be tomorrow from 4 to 5 p.m. Awesome. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, and like I said, such a valued partner in the full spectrum. Thank you so much for all of your hard work in that arena. Yes. Um, and uh, as usual, thank you to HempFest. There were a couple of links that went in there as well, um, including um, sponsorship for the cleanups, if you would like. Uh, you might have shown, I showed you my little view, because if you do come to Mulcatillo on the 22nd, uh, very unofficial, but um, my backyard's a fun place to hang out and um, have a sesh. So at any rate, um, it's just a little friendly competition between the cleanups. That's all I'm saying. I'm just trying to like get the edge. Um, all righty. Uh, so um, we do also have other committees. Anytime you would like to um, get involved, uh, Jill is your point person. Um, Kim also is fantastic at helping out with that. So you can reach out to either one of them and um, we'll make sure you get hooked up in a place that is good and comfortable for you um, to do uh, any of this fantastic work or connect you with partner organizations like HempFest or the full spectrum. All right. So I am not Gregory Foster. Um, and Gregory Foster is out of town this week. Uh, so I am going to attempt. Uh, oh, so Sean, I'm seeing you wave. Is that for me? I guess not. Okay. I, I, I just had I, I have to bail, so I'm just saying oh. goodbye. <laughs> Have a great rest of your afternoon. You can get the rest on YouTube. Bye, Sean. <laughs> Happy to see you, friend. <laughs> Sorry, it looked like a stop what you're doing right now. I have a thing. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Yeah. One of those. Bye, Bye Sean. Um, okay, so I um, would still, even though Gregory is not able to be here today, um, would like to encourage you all to check out the Cannabis Observer. Um, they provide an invaluable service, particularly here in Washington State, of making sure that we are all apprised of all of the various and sundry meetings that can sometimes be very long and difficult to get through. The Observer goes for us um, and uh, gives us all a good reporting. So if you have the ability to support them in any way, please do so, and we'll get a link um, in there. Um, however, I do also go to quite a few of these meetings um, in my role here as your interim executive director um, and would like to share a few um, things that are uh, critical for you to have in your calendar. So the Social Equity and Cannabis Task Force meeting um, met at the end of July and it was um, the, thank you, Jill, um, the um, full uh, task force meeting. Um, in general, uh, there was not a final decision made by the end of the meeting, but the two primary concerns that came up throughout the conversation was that there is money that is not enough to actually execute any program in its full form, but it is a significant amount of money that does need to be spent before it disappears back into the general budget, um, into the general fund. So um, there was lots of conversation on finding rapid focus on making sure that that money gets put towards the use that it should be um, put towards. Um, so that focus right now is on a mentorship program. Um, and upcoming is the committee meeting on, oh, for Pete's sake. 
I lost, there we go, thank you. Um, upcoming on August 17th um, at 1 p.m. is the Disproportionately Impacted Communities Committee that will be continuing to talk about um, that program and how it might um, look moving forward. I would encourage everybody, um, if you have any time to drop in on any of these meetings at any time, please do. Um, there's a, a lot of fear that the work that the task force is doing is starting to languish um, in the mire of bureaucracy, which um, is hard to pretend might not have been intentional, right? That, that this very important critical work um, not be lost to bureaucracy. And the way that we do that is by transparency, eyes on and accountability. And that comes with our attendance and pushing um, legislators and regulators to do their job and do it um, in a timely fashion. So um, I'm requesting that all of you just drop in whenever you can um, and, and eyes on because that's what's gonna continue to make this work move forward and to not uh, lose stamina. Uh, this is where it gets critical is when people start getting frustrated that not enough is happening or the right things are happening. That's when you need to kind of dig deeper and, and keep pushing forward. So I would appreciate your assistance in that. Um, also, another interesting development, uh, the Department of Ecology Task Force, um, uh, the Cannabis Science Task Force, um, wrapped up its final meeting um, and discussed, um, and Jill's going to put in, there's another link to the Observer article on that. Um, I would like to say thank you very much, uh, in particular to uh, Nick Mosley and Confidence Analytics for their representation on that task force and for asking the tough questions like, why is this committee being concluded uh, over a year ahead of time? And if there is still work to do, why are these non-agency stakeholders being cut out for the purposes of um, creating an interagency uh, committee that uh, is only government agencies without actually any industry stakeholders? Um, so more to come on that. Uh, there's some interesting non-information uh, that we still kind of need to get our hands on, but do know that um, our regulatory and legislative folks are, are working hard to get the informa information that um, we need in order to push back even harder, um, particularly since we know that there will be some agency request legislation um, in this upcoming session that, that we're gonna need to go to work on. Um, okay, so now on to LCB. Um, there are a couple of rulemaking um, CRs open. Um, I do want to call everybody's attention, um, putting a link to the recording here in the chat. Uh, if you were not able to watch the deliberative dialogue on synth synthetically derived cannabinoids, I can promise you it is a three hours of um, just really big, important information. Um, I've now listened to it twice. And uh, I, I, I'm not going to say you have to listen to it twice, but it gets really into the, the deep science and um, had a lovely conversation. We had happy hour immediately following the deliberative dialogue. And for those that were in attendance, we were able to kind of discuss takeaways. And, and I promise you that it, it will be three hours well spent um, if you listen. Um, and along those lines, we do not yet um, have a, oh, actually we do. So we have a CR 101 um, for a pre-proposal statement of inquiry to consider establishing a new rule section that would allow LCB to evaluate additives, solvents, ingredients, or components used in the production and processing of marijuana products to determine whether such, such substances pose a risk to public health or youth access. So that is what the um, CR 101 is written as, but this is uh, really specifically getting at um, synthetically derived cannabinoids, et cetera, and the various iterations um, that are happening uh, and all of the interesting R&D that is happening. So um, comments are due on that August 20th. Uh, please feel free to uh, comment yourself or as your business, um, but the Alliance will also be um, providing an industry comment. So again, um, any feedback at any time is, is uh, highly valued. Also, there is a CR 102 um, that is due August 18th if you have any comments on licensee background checks. Um, if you've been following that, it's been, it's been sailing through pretty quickly and we expect that it will continue to, but um, please do take a look at that and make sure um, you have the opportunity to comment if you would like. 
Um, quality control testing and products requirements um, right now that is still in limbo. We still do not yet have a date um, for when those conversations will be resumed, but the promise is that it will happen before the end of the year. We shall see. Um, but we are continuing that pressure on LCB to make sure that that um, those rules get put in place sooner rather than later. Um, and then finally, Danielle is also on vacation, but I wanted to give a shout out in particular to Trailblazing, um, at her and her staff. And um, I know a few of you also were involved in this effort in writing letters to LCD concerning minors on farms. Um, so basically maintaining the emergency rulemaking that happened during COVID um, so that uh, your children are allowed to come on your farm with you while you do your work. Um, uh, it was a big farm effort, but she had a, a if you know Danielle, you know this is how she works. It was a scheduled um, letter campaign uh, that had a letter going about every other day to LCB for a little bit over a month. Um, and uh, we know that that had a really big impact. And so I want to say a special thank you uh, to their effort in making sure that that continued. All right. Any questions about regulatory? All right, um, then with that, um, Kim Dakota is our membership director and does a fantastic job. And um, she is going to lead us in our member highlight for this month's meeting. Thank you so much, Kim, for being here and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Caitlin. And it's so great to see so many people here in August because it's summer in Seattle and uh, it's also wonderful to work with such passionate, wonderful people. So this is our membership spotlight time where we take just a few minutes to uh, learn a little bit more about our other members. And our uh, member today is a new member and that's Greenflower and they do cannabis education and training. And I would like to introduce Mayo Perry. Hi guys, I'm Mayo. It's nice to meet you. I'm the business solutions manager for Washington here at Greenflower. Uh, when Kim asked me to ask, say, who is Greenflower? It was like, oh gosh, okay. Um, to break it down, we are the most comprehensive online training platform ever built for the cannabis space. Uh, I work directly with companies of all sizes across all the verticals to support employee onboarding and training. And then as an organization, we work with universities and community colleges nationwide, as well as government agencies. I mean, our real goal is to educate and develop high quality cannabis professionals. And ultimately our current library offers more than 2000 hours of cannabis led courses by 700 different industry experts. And we are expanding on it constantly. Our experience has shown that even incremental improvements in training boost productivity, innovation and employee retention. And ultimately we believe that our industry thrives when we will continue to grow uh, when it's filled with skilled and knowledgeable people like everyone on this call. Arming new people coming into the industry with robust education really just supports the success of our industry overall. So I'm really excited to be a part of the Alliance and I hope you'll reach out to me if you ever wanna discuss more. Thank you so much. And uh, you can find more information about Greenflower in on our website, membership tab, membership members of the Alliance. And I'll put the link uh, to Greenflower in the chat. Thanks everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks Mayo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. And thank you, Mayo. It's great to see you again. Um, we did a partnership with um, Greenflower and Western. I was, yes, Western, which is actually not Western for me. It is Northern, but at any rate, um, where we were able to do a, a great uh, one day seminar uh, that was really wonderful and got to see lots of your faces there as well. Um, so thank you very much. Let's see. All right, everyone, we're rounding the back end here. Um, so um, we are now on to upcoming events and then we'll have good for the cause if uh, anybody has any final announcements but um so of course the summit is coming up now on september 23rd and september 24th um we know it will be a great super informative day so um you will of course get an email as soon as those new, the new tickets are available for um the restructure um and so please do sign up as soon as you're able to um and we really do look forward to um the summit this year 
Jill, I just jumped right in because apparently Gregory not being here has meant that I'm just going to do the whole thing. I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you to um, talk about the remainder of the events that we have upcoming in the near future. Yeah, so like we alluded to earlier, our fabulous education committee is going to be doing um, our webinar Wednesday. It's Cannabis 101 Back to Basics, and that's going to be at noon, um, as all of our webinar Wednesdays are always on Wednesdays at noon. Um, and you can get the link. I'm going to drop it in there right, right for you. And this is a really good one to be able to bring a friend, bring your skeptical cousin, bring, bring everybody so that we can have a really good basics conversation with some of our industry professionals and leaders. Um, and as um, you know, we kind of created office hours as a way to connect with you guys throughout the pandemic. And it has been wildly successful. We do it every Monday and Friday. Um, and it's basically where Caitlin and I sit in, is sit in a Zoom meeting and, and wait for you guys to show up and answer your questions and communicate. So if you ever have any questions at all, you can always, you can always reach out to us by email. But if you want to chat face to face, we do do our office hours every Monday and Friday, which you can find by following that link or by just going to our events page. It's always up on our events page. Um, in addition, we do a weekly happy hour, which is a lot of fun. It's a little bit industry, a little bit silly, and a lot of fun. Um, and we've created a really neat community, some of which are on this call. I see you. Thank you. Um, and it's a really great place to just kind of connect with folks. And it's every single Tuesday from four to five ish um, here at the Alliance. And it's again, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and then just so that everybody has it all av av available to you, you know, we are on all of the social medias. So please follow us on all of the social medias. You can see our, we have a Facebook page that is just the Canna Alliance. And that is a really great place. You can see, you will always be able to get our webinar Wednesdays. There's always new and fun content coming out, kind of a good way to keep up to date with us, uh, as well as we have a Facebook group. And so that is open. It's the family of the Cannabis Alliance, and it's open to all of our members. And it's a great place to post articles and links and what you've got going on and what we've got going on a great again another great place to find all of our previous content um and so i would strongly recommend if you have not joined our facebook group yet follow that handy dandy little link right there and we'll we'll get you connected in addition um we also have a youtube channel where you can get this meeting as soon as it's up as well as all of our past meetings and all of our previous webinar Wednesdays so if you miss something or like let's say you have a meeting at noon on a Wednesday um, but you really wanted to check out a webinar there we always upload them up by the end of the week um, to our YouTube page so it's a really great way to, to stay up to date you know and if you do the YouTube make sure you hit that little subscribe button so that you get notifications when we upload new content um, yeah, and that's kind of what we've got going on right now, other than I will mention it again, our handy dandy Washington Cannabis Summit is coming next year on the 23rd and 4th. And I really, really hope that, you know, if you're as a business would be interested in sponsoring and as individuals will be, we'll look forward to seeing you all there. It's going to be a really great conversation. And, you know, and I, I think that we've, we've worked really hard to bring you guys some really excellent content. So I'm excited about it. And I hope that you guys are as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, all right. Good deal. 20 minutes left. Uh, so does anybody have anything that is good for the cause um, that you'd like to share? Jason, I have a note that you might have a thing, but I'm not sure if we already covered it, maybe. Or maybe Jason has had that drop off. Hey, it's fantastic to have to shuffle through pages of attendees, everyone. Thanks for, for hanging in this long. Um, all right, so uh, does anybody else have anything good for the cause before we log off for today? All right, we covered a lot. If you have any questions about anything following, Jill or I are always available to help answer. Obviously, Kim is also here to assist at any time. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. And um, we hope you have a great rest of the week and that you're able to stay cool through this heat wave, where, whether you're in New Mexico or here in Washington State. <laughs> All right, bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks bye. for coming. <laughs>